Global Reboot was created as countries and economies emerged from the pandemic. But rather than rebuilding the same old systems and the same old problems, we called for a reboot. I'm your host, Ravi Agrawal, Foreign Policy's Editor-in-Chief. Here on Global Reboot, I sit with some of the smartest thinkers and doers around, and we push for solutions. This season, we're looking at resetting the US-China relationship, dealing with the rise of AI, preserving our oceans, and much more. Check out Global Reboot in partnership with the Doha Forum, wherever you get your podcasts. You're listening to One Decision, the podcast that looks at the key choices and decisions affecting our world today. I'm your host, Julia McFarlane. This week, Australia entered its nuclear age, not that of weapons, but of its new state-of-the-art nuclear-powered submarines designed and built to counter growing Chinese aggression in the Pacific region. The subs are the jewels in the crown of the AUKUS Defence Pact, a mutual agreement between Australia, the United Kingdom and the United States. Speaking alongside President Biden, the British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak and Australian Prime Minister Anthony Albanese unveiled the upgrades in San Diego, California. The new subs will be able to travel faster and further than their current diesel fleet and Australia will have the ability to carry out long-range strikes for the very first time. Also this week, the Brits unveiled a new defence paper, the government setting out its assessment of emerging threats. The Integrated Review Refresh, or IR23, was commissioned as a result of new threats from Russia's invasion of Ukraine to China's growing assertion and aggression. Sunak describes China as an epoch-defining challenge, but one that needed to include engagement. Today, we are looking at some of the ways in which China is presenting a risk to our safety and security that may be less discussed than the headline-grabbing moves in the South China Sea or in the summits publicly supporting Russia. Through China's monopoly of tech, our digital supply chain is growing vulnerable. And as more and more of our household and everyday devices and appliances are going online, something they all need to operate comes directly from China. Cellular modules, tiny chips which have the ability to transmit data pretty much independently, could be a chink in our digital armour. Someone who cares very deeply about this emerging risk is a long-time contact of my co-host Sir Richard Dearlove, the former chief of Britain's MI6. He's called Charlie Parton. He's a veteran British diplomat who spent decades based in and focused on Beijing. He was also a former special advisor to the Foreign Affairs Committee. Let's get straight to the discussion. Now, we wanted to talk to you, Charlie, today because at a time when we're seeing how Russia now has powerful leverage over dozens of countries in the EU. They've been able to profit and finance their ruthless war in Ukraine from billions of dollars they've made from selling oil and gas to the continent, which the West is only very slowly and bit by bit managing to wean itself off from in in various uh, stages and sanctions. At a time that we're seeing all of this, we could be staring down the barrel of another similar situation of leaving ourselves and our supply chains uh, for things that we cannot do without in everyday life, leaving us vulnerable to threat, extortion, disruption, maybe even destruction. And I want to quote the head of the German security service who recently warned, Russia is the storm, but China is climate change. So Charlie, firstly, could you explain to our listeners what exactly is the scale of this problem, which essentially is our exposure in our digital supply chains to China? Uh, And have there been any instances yet of these problems coming up to the surface yet? Or is this still a a threat that lies in the future and one that we're not entirely sure yet how it will play out? Well, let me start by saying that I think that quote from the head of the German uh, security services is is one of the better ones that have, we've we've heard in the last six months. I think it's an, in, entirely accurate, and I think the reason for that is is three sort of threats which uh, are we're facing. Both uh, wh- whether you think in terms of semiconductors or cellular internet of things modules or 
5G telecommunications, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then they're all, all many ways connected. I mean, the, the first is that if you can only get these, the supply of these things from China or indeed from Taiwan, if Taiwan's disrupted, um, but particularly if you can only get them from China or the Chinese have a monopoly on this, which is what they're trying to achieve in, in many of those areas, then of course you create an enormous dependency. Uh, and we've, we've seen that in, in, in COVID through PPE where much of the world was dependent upon China and China was prepared, or the Chinese Communist Party was prepared to use that um, as a weapon. So that's, that is um, what, one angle where I think we've got to be very, um, very careful because it's in policies connected with, with um, those sorts of things that the pressure can be applied. We don't like your policy on human rights and you might want to consider it if you want to continue supplies of um, cellular modules or whatever. That, that would be the, the implicit threat. So dependency it, with, with, a, with a, a regime like the Chinese Communist Party is something to be avoided. Um, the second fear is that in certain technologies, if they're entirely, you're entirely dependent upon China, it is at a time of hostility, you could be uh, vulnerable to, as you rightly say, either the destruction of, of, of those things that you need, or perhaps even more cleverly, the, the erosion of their ability to, to function to some extent, just make you a lot less uh, efficient and, and uh, wear you down. So that, that is something that needs to be avoided. And the third area is um, you know, data. We've been, uh, we, we all heard the, the, the new cliche, if you can have a new cliche, um, that, that, that data is the new oil. But uh, you can make some very powerful um, intelligence, military, um, economic tools by capturing, uh, or capturing is a, a loaded term, but by having possession of vast amounts of data. And China is quite systematically going about assembling that data, even if much of it is still enciphered and cannot be uh, used and read at the moment. With the advent of, of quantum computing and um, future AI tools, it may very well be that they can read it. So they're, they're getting it together now. So, I, I mean, I, I find it extraordinary but understandable that the first reaction of people when you start saying these things is, yes, but give us an example. I mean, where where are they illegally egressing data or where are they putting pressure on you? And my reaction to that is, well, you don't get into a boxing ring and, and wait till you've been hit firmly in the face before you start training. I mean, prophylactically, you need to make sure that you have your guard up well in advance. Um, so a responsible government is, should not be allowing these dependencies and vulnerabilities to exist, even, if, even in the absence of any um, evidence that the Chinese at the present are using them. So I, I don't uh, accept the argument that we have to provide evidence. We should be making sure that there is no evidence by taking measures in advance. That reminds me of the whole kerfuffle about Huawei. Richard, you were pretty key in the lobbying effort to get the government to ban Huawei. Um, tell us about that campaign and who uh, who were your biggest obstacles in that push? Well, I mean, we I started sounding off about the problems of Huawei quite a long time ago. I mean, it goes back a long way because BT signed its first contracts with Huawei um, back in the early 2000s. And even then, some of us objected to the fact that they were making Huawei one of their key partners in developing mobile telephony in the UK. So the problem had been there potentially for a, for a, for a long period of time. But I think what really made me uh, cross about this is that the government initially it wheeled out various people from the intelligence community to tell us that Huawei was not a threat, uh, which was the most extraordinary event. And, um, you know, some quite senior people stood up and said publicly, oh, we've looked at this and we can manage the problem. Well, I was just very vociferous. Which government was that? I think it was Theresa. Well, I think it was Theresa May. Actually, I think it was at the beginning, start of Theresa May as prime minister. It was in that period. It was before the policy changed. But I, I mean, I had a lot of backing from people all over the place, um, and you know, gradually we managed to 
change the direction of the tanker, the super tanker. But it did it did take quite a long time. But I, I, I mean, I think Julia, it was stunningly arrogant. Actually, I mean, there was the the various members of the British establishment. Um, standing up and saying, no, we can manage this problem. You mentioned three things, China using dependency as a weapon. And then two other uh, issues that I want to go into uh, in a bit more detail. You talked of how China can erode the quality of our critical services, our everyday services, and also the weaponization of data. I think possibly the best way of going into this is... Just also going back to something else you mentioned earlier in the conversation, which was cellular modules. Now, I think the simplest way to describe cellular modules is these are these are essentially chips. These are uh, little chips that allow for devices to connect to the internet and receive connectivity. And it's part they they, they are used as part of what is known as the Internet of Things, which people will have read about or, or, or possibly heard about which is becoming a really, really uh, important system in our global economy. More and more of our household devices, more and more of our manufacturing, our transport, not just domestic applications, and also military. Um, All aspects of our connectivity are involving these chips, which facilitate what is referred to as the Internet of Things. I read a paper that you wrote on these cellular modules and how they are really an an underreported sort of front line in in this battle against Chinese influence in our digital supply chains. And you, you said that the presence of Chinese cellular modules in our systems possesses a greater threat than does relying on Chinese companies for 5G. Now, given how many governments made made such a fuss of the issue of Huawei, and yet we haven't really heard this out in the mainstream. It, 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 it's worth going into, perhaps, why that is. Can you explain to us, Charlie, first of all, how dependent are we on these cellular model, module chips? There was a piece recently that was headlined, Is My Fridge Spying on Me?, which I think is probably a little facetious uh, way of illustrating um, the scope of this problem. But if you could explain to our listeners what exactly is the scale of this vulnerability? Yeah, Julia, I do wish I'd never written the word fridge in that damn paper, um, because of course, you know, journalists inevitably tacked onto it, uh, and it trivializes what is such a serious issue. I should just say on, on the question of, of cellular modules that, um, you know, not only do they do all the things you say, but they also, you know, they're more than just a chip because they, they have a central processing unit um, that, that they push out a vast amount of detail and take uh, of, of data and take in, and that's the that's the whole point of them. And they're there to um, link up with other modules, which they do automatically without human intervention, and improve the processes. And um, you know, increasingly, they are in in all our processes, and will become much more so. And the Chinese uh, Communist Party knows this, and it's set out on a deliberate policy to establish um, a triopoly of its own three companies in global market. We're currently, these companies which most people won't have heard of, but in many ways they should become as well-known names as Huawei and ZTE and Hikvision, et cetera, because they're, they're every bit as threatening. Um, Quectel, Fibocom, and China Mobile, they currently have 54% of the global market um, by sales and 75% by connectivity. And the aim is to get that as close to 100 and drive out the competition, at which point, as I say, you know, the dependencies, the, the, the dangers of, of erosion or destruction of your, or your capability and, and de- data egress become eminently possible. So that is, that is the, the Chinese aim. And you know, just to give you a, this is a couple of examples of why I worry so much about these, particularly in, in, in terms of the way that you could, let alone the data that's, that, that's being egressed. And it doesn't take much software writing to get this this stuff out, I mean, it's, it's basically it, it's it's as though you know, Richard's old organisation has, has put a technical operation in in your house or your company or or, or your government building, uh, except that you've done it yourself. But just give a couple of examples, for instance. 
smart meters. We all have smart meters. These are the con for the convenience of, of the electricity companies, not for us, really. Um, but it is not very difficult for the suppliers of the modules, cellular modules in those meters to know exactly where all those are and, and where the base stations for them are. They have IMEI numbers. You, you, you can do this very simply. And it would not be difficult also to send uh, software updates to those which would, um, at a given moment, crash the whole lot. And, and, and by crashing at a time of, say, high demand, um, or, or all the smart meters, you could probably bring down the grid. Or you could bring down, if it was a naval base, for instance, the electricity in a naval base. Uh, or if you, uh, because let's say all the alarm systems will have one of these cellular modules in, you could turn off the alarms. Uh, or turn off the air conditioner in the building and make it make it uninhabitable um, if, if it was at the wrong time of year. It, I don't know if you've seen the film The Italian Job, great for, film where, where they mess up the Milan traffic light system in order to do a gold heist. Well, you could mess up the traffic system in London or Washington or, or wherever you wanted if it uses these these forms of modules. So that is that is the threat. And as I say, I don't think a responsible government should be allowing that sort of thing to happen. That's really interesting. If the Chinese are the principal or majority suppliers of this kind of tech to the overseas market, and as you say, you you know you talked about erosion of these services, and you've given us some examples of of how that can be actualized in practice. That essentially involves the Chinese exporting chips and tech that are basically sort of Trojan horses, is it not? You know, designed to to degrade or or even sabotage other nations' critical infrastructures in order to achieve whatever goal that they have. But what would the strategic goal be here? Because surely, if those governments know that that's the case and the Chinese are sabotaging them in in this way via these chips. Surely they would be found out, and then they would be boycotted as a result. Or, or is the short-term damage that they could do with these processes is is that worth the cost? As opposed to having your strategic objective being surveillance, essentially, which requires installing these products in the West over a long period of time, and surely that would necessitate having a more positive trading relationship uh, on on the basis of these particular goods. Well, I mean, the examples I gave were, of course, in, in a sense, the doomsday. That, that is when hostility has got to the, the extent of, um, you know, war by a different form. And, and I said that governments need to have that in mind, to protect yourself, because you don't want to allow that um, possibility because it can be used as, as leverage against you. But in, 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 in the shorter term, as it were, uh, yeah, let's give an, another example. I mean, if you own a Tesla S-Plate car or, or one or two other types of Tesla car which have a Quectel module in, all the data from that car potentially can go back to, to China. So, um, uh, or... Uh, you can imagine uh, uh, other things, whether that's your your um, your ring doorbell or your camera doorbell, whatever. All that information goes back. Now, China, um, a few years ago, did a massive attack on OPM, the Office of Personal Management, and got hold of a lot of sensitive data about American civil servants, including CIA and FBI officers. Well, imagine if you are um, a CIA officer or a not just CIA, but a sensitive government official, an important government official, um, driving one of those cars, which the information of which, and not just the geolocation, but that's enough, that's serious enough, goes back to Beijing. You can learn an awful lot about who's who, what they're doing, with whom, when you start putting that data together with other forms of, of data, which also um, are vulnerable. Uh, so, you know, this is not just a matter of the eventuality of serious hostilities, but as an ongoing form of, of um, weakening the defences of, of, of others, or indeed um, commercial exploitation. After all, um, let's supposing I, I wish to take over a, 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 an American agricultural firm, which is what's happening quite often. If I know more about that firm as a result of the data that's egressed about from it than the firm knows itself, uh, I can push a very hard bargain, thank you very much. Or I might know in advance 
data from American harvests for soybeans. So I can push a very good deal to the disadvantage of America or, or, or whichever country it is. So um, there are plenty of other uh, forms of loss which one can experience well short of, of the scenarios, which I, the doomsday scenarios, which I started with. Richard, what Charlie is saying is is really fascinating. But I mean, obviously, espionage and surveillance in order to get data and intel on government officials, whether that's for, you know, to try and extort various ministers or, or try and put pressure on different governments to try and exert influence and, and get favorable policy or so on and so forth. But if we zoom out a bit, the cost for having cheap technology that can empower you know millions of people to connect up into the internet have a better quality of life promote small businesses and things the fact that cheap manufacture of, of Chinese chips helps a lot of that happen. And why can we not simply just require government ministers to have sensible anti-surveillance measures? I mean, we've seen recently governments banning their members of parliament and their employees from having TikTok on their phones, for example. I mean, cutting the Chinese out of our entire economy uh, to try and mitigate this risk would be a huge cost. Do you think it's worth it? I don't think anyone's suggesting, uh, we look, we're not suggesting, you know, a complete sort of ban on technical or, or sophisticated technical trade with China. I, I think one has to, as it were, be balanced and reasonable. But on the other hand, if we understand the precise nature of the threat, we can then, as it were, take measures to develop the relationship in China, which takes account of those problems. Um, I think in a recent interview, you know, with um, Pompeo about all sorts of things, we talked about China, you know, I asked him the question, what's your answer to dealing with the problem of, you know, trading with China? And I mean, he just immediately said reciprocity. Uh, which actually, if you think about it, is a very clever and a very pragmatic answer. Because if the Chinese, as it were, gave us the same opportunities in their country as we're giving them in our country, then you can begin to see that, you know, we can build a trading relationship which has a sense of control and equality about it. Uh, I mean, obviously, you don't need in your economy to protect everything. Um, that's ridiculous. But you need to identify what your crucial points of national security are and make sure that you take account of the multiple threats that come from different countries. But at the moment, you know, we've been so benign towards China. We've allowed them through doors which should be locked. We've allowed them into positions uh, in, our tech, in crucial technology and in critical infrastructure and, uh, you know, we're now trying to get them out. I think the problem is that people get very excited by the commercial opportunities, by cheapness, by economy and all the rest of it. Bearing in mind, however, the Chinese have built these companies by subsidizing them and putting, putting competitors out of business. And, uh, you know, a lot of these companies do have strong military connections in China. So, I mean, the question you're asking is, is, is complex and difficult. But I don't think any of us are sort of so Luddite as to say, oh, we have nothing to do with the Chinese. It's not like that at all. It's educating ourselves and knowing what we have to protect and taking the correct measures. But as Charlie's already pointed out, doing something about this is complex and difficult. And I mean, the irony is that during the Cold War, we did have a system which, as it were, uh, allowed us to trade with bits of the Soviet empire, but at the same time, we embargoed or put fences around those areas which were very sensitive. It was maybe simpler then because the trading relationship was not nearly as complex as it is with China. Right. But what is the end game with this? The end game of this threat, I think, is also quite hard to really quantify. Um, I want to quote from from your paper on the risks of cellular modules, where you really sort of encapsulate what data means to the CCP. And 
I quote, new and emerging technology is central to the Chinese Communist Party's ability to achieve its goals. The most game-changing advantage of tech is that it enables the accumulation of massive amounts of data. The CCP views data as a strategic resource. You quoted earlier that, that quote about data being the new oil. When processed and aggregated, data can support China's interests across military, economic, political, cultural, and other domains. That in itself may make sense and is really, really clearly uh, summarized, but to what end? Why are the Chinese collecting our personal data? What use is it for them? I mean, I understand the reason that Cambridge Analytica and Facebook were so desperate to track our every moves, largely in order to monetize it and sell it off to people who want our private information, such as political campaigns. And we saw that in that scandal um, following the 2016 election. But the CCP, I mean, what do they want from foreign nationals data. I mean, they've got a vast monitoring network on their own citizens, which they use in order to monitor their behavior, to sweep for dissent, uh, control the populace and so on. Not to be facetious, but what does the CCP care about my, for example, my online shopping habits and my obsession with sourcing yarn and knitting patterns and holiday homes in Cornwall that I can't afford? What do they plan on doing with that information? Well, uh, Julia, I'm fascinated to know know about fascinated to know about some of your personal habits. But um, actually, if you don't mind, I'll I'll I'll, I'll go up to a, a, a rather higher level than that because I think it is relevant actually. Um, and in fact, uh, if you'll also forgive me, this is a piece of gross personal uh, advertising because I have a paper coming out in in by the end of the month on is China a threat? And the answer is to right it is. Um, but the heart of the matter is, what is the ultimate aim of the Chinese Communist Party? Um, and uh, I, I think it's um, very apparent, and I could bore you at length, but read the paper instead, that if you look at the what they call the second centennial goal, the, the 100th anniversary of the Chinese Communist Party, 2049, uh, it talks about an aim of becoming a strong, harmonious, civilized um, modern socialist state. But what it really means, Sean of party speak, is to become the one number world's number one superpower, to put America down in number two and so ordain the world so that, such that it is better in the interests and values of, of the Chinese Communist Party. So, um, you know, so, so, so rising above all in the bits of individual data, dominating the new science and technologies, and particularly the industries that that depend from those, and data and the use of data. And I think they're, they're by far the most important because not only will that give China the economic rents to sustain itself as, as the superpower, but through all that, that, that data and dependency, which will come from, from occupying the highlands of science and technology, uh, it puts the rest of the world thoroughly under its thumb. Well, Charlie, we recently spoke um, to an author uh, for an episode about the metaverse. And one of the main reasons he, he explained that we don't have the metaverse is there does not exist at the moment the technology to store the huge amounts of data that would be needed for all the real-time rendering and loading and updating of the digital sort of environment of the metaverse. We do not have servers. We don't have hard drives and storage systems capable of handling all of that. And I read that by 2025, it's estimated that 463 exabytes of data will be created every day globally. Um, they say that's the equivalent of 212 million DVDs per day. An exabyte is a quintillion bytes. I mean, essentially what I'm saying is the fact that we each, ev each and every one of us creates through the internet, through the billions of WhatsApp messages we create daily, through the billions of emails we send, all of the pictures we take, our live stream, our videos that we put up to Instagram, um, the data every time we flick on and off our smart meters. How are the Chinese even able to process any of that in a meaningful way that will allow them to weaponize data in uh, in the ways that in, in in which we've discussed, that's a very tech heavy question. I'm sorry to ask it. <laughs> it is tech heavy. I'm, I'm I'm not a scientist, but um, the 
I am told that in, you know, in the future, that um, as AI and quantum computing becomes more of a reality, um, then that sort of thing will be a, a lot easier. So, again, going back to the, one of the earliest points we made is is that governments have a responsibility to look into the future uh, and protect against possible harms if they're if they're big enough. Um, for your, for your listeners might be interested. Um, I think I think a petabyte of information is equivalent to thirty billion pages of A4. Um, there's a very good paper, incidentally, by Samantha Hoffman called "Engineering Global Consent," which looks at just one Chinese state-owned company which claims to uh, export back to China every year. And this was a few years ago, uh, four petabytes, so so about 120 billion pages of A4 of information. So one doesn't want to uh, exaggerate that. It absolutely everything is seen all the time. But uh, I, th I think it depends what comes in the future. And with um, the right form of machine learning and, and possibly AI tools in the future, you can work through that data, pull out the bits that, that, that you need. Richard, as our resident uh, tame former spy master uh, in the house, Essentially, what this is, is that is a mammoth espionage operation, really. Data collection is intelligence gathering. And because, because I, I really want to try and get to the sort of the, the heart of, of what it is we're staring down the barrel of, if we were to imagine that the Chinese have an in to every microphone, every camera, every measurable tool that gives meaningful information about our lives, if they are able to access all of that uh, in all kinds of countries around the world um, and all this information about all of us, is the fear that knowledge is essentially power, that by knowing their adversaries, by understanding their ways of life, their priorities, their habits, their hobbies, all of this kind of stuff, that there is a way in which they can exert some kind of control or influence through that technology? Is it more about the application of propaganda that will be masterfully disguised as content that we are already consuming. I, I think, you know, there's an uncertainty. We have an uncertainty about w what China's behavior and intentions will be. It is an unattractive uh, political system for us in the West because it is so authoritarian. And, 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 and in, in fact, as we've seen in Hong Kong, specifically anti-democratic. So we would be unwise if we didn't, as it were, take notice of what China is doing, because it's built this system of control in a way it's now having the technology to extend this control beyond its borders into countries, you know, which are completely different value systems, political systems. And, uh, you know, the, the Chinese are, are probing and pushing it. If China were, let's say, like Australia, we wouldn't be worried about, or we wouldn't be nearly so worried, or, you know, we, we, we wouldn't accept, and we wouldn't be concerned about what was happening. Uh, it's China's intentions, and its stated intentions, as Charlie's mentioned, in, in, in 2049, its objectives, you know, to, to, to dominate globally, and it's building a system which we as it were, are very worried about, which, as it were, completely rejects our value systems, as I've already said. So the question you're asking is a complicated one, and we would be very unwise to sit here and do nothing about it. We are waking up and doing something serious about it at long last. And this podcast, in a way, is, is a great vehicle for educating people about the problem. And I think Charlie's brilliant at articulating where the threat lies in these very mundane areas of our life. And I think that's what's so worrying. Global Reboot was created as countries and economies emerged from the pandemic. But rather than rebuilding the same old systems and the same old problems, we called for a reboot. I'm your host, Ravi Agrawal, Foreign Policy's Editor-in-Chief. Here on Global Reboot, I sit with some of the smartest thinkers and doers around, and we push for solutions. This season, we're looking at resetting the US-China relationship, dealing with the rise of AI, 
preserving our oceans, and much more. Check out Global Reboot in partnership with the Doha Forum, wherever you get your podcasts. So, Richard, you've known uh, Charlie Parton for quite a while. He He's such a well-respected and renowned expert on, on China. And I think it's interesting because this conversation that we've had has been very, very tech heavy. I think that there is a bit of a disconnect between leaders and experts, leaders in the in the intelligence space, in the national security space, in the defense space, and the everyday general public. And to some extent, you know, lawmakers and and politicians, um, and generally the ones who don't have a particular interest in national security issues like this. And I was struck by that unprecedented announcement or press conference that the heads of MI5 and the FBI gave last year when it came to the threat from China. And they revealed so much, actually, about the threat. They, um, you know, they talked about Chinese agents. It was quite unprecedented for them both to appear together and to give a sort of an on-camera statement about, about this. And we hear time and time again, a lot of national security experts like yourself, like Charlie Parton, saying that, you know, as the German minister said, Russia is the storm, China is climate change. And I think the disconnect here is because a lot of that potential threat, I think, has sort of yet to manifest. We And we covered this a bit in that conversation with Charlie Parton. We don't really know yet what China intends to do with all of this data and all of this, you know, privacy that they've invaded. There's obviously the issues of government figures, important figures who may be subject to blackmail because of their private data being compromised and the political and national security ramifications of that. Same goes for, you know, big business leaders. Information is power, knowledge is power. And yes, that can always be weaponized. But I think to the everyday man on the street, um, you know, our privacy is being invaded on a regular basis by all sorts of non-state actors, state actors, companies that track us, hackers that wheedle their way into our systems. I think it is there's a disconnect and it's hard to get very incensed by the Chinese capacity to invade our data and to infiltrate a lot of these systems, particularly because we haven't yet seen what they plan on doing with that, is there not? I mean, do you accept that a lot of this uh, this is still hypothetical and potentially a problem in enlisting support to, to your cause, given that we have Russia dropping barrel bombs on hospitals in, in Syria and taking out critical infrastructure in Ukraine and soldiers carrying out alleged war crimes on the banks of Europe. Can you see how it may be difficult for, for people to look at all of these leading figures in the national security world who say, you know, Russia's not the problem, it's China that's a long-term problem, and that there is a bit of a disconnect here. Yes, of course there's a disconnect. And it's very difficult, I think, for people who are not professionally involved in national security to look at these issues and have a deep perspective about them. But uh, the fact is that the relationship with China has evolved in a direction which is extremely worrying. And then to put bits of your absolutely fundamental, you know, way of managing modern life in the hands of a country which has a totally different set of values and has started to behave in a very aggressive fashion. I mean, look at its behavior in Hong Kong, uh, look at its behavior in the South China Sea, look at its attitude towards India, uh, look at some of the statements that have been made from the 20th Party Congress. I mean, there are many, many examples as to why we should worry and be concerned. And I suppose it, it's really being sensible about our vulnerabilities, if you see what I mean. And I think it is the duty of the people who are professionally concerned with this to try to educate the public. 
about the problem. Um, they don't necessarily have to change their lifestyles. They don't necessarily have to stop using social media. But it, we're really, you know, putting out an alert, which is basically warning the government or saying to the government, you know, don't put National Health Service data in the hands of a Chinese company, which is storing it on a server inside China, where um, we have no control over what happens to it. And I think, you know, it, it, we, we would be being neglectful if we didn't sort of articulate this problem and speak about it. So I, I, I think, you know, if, if China's value system was the same as the West's, we wouldn't be losing a lot of sleep over it. But I think, you know, what's happening is deeply worrying. I, I totally appreciate it. But I mean, it's it's sort of, is it a separate issue, though? Because, you know, they are far from the only country that oppresses its people. And, and I, again, I think, you know, is that an international concern insofar as it presents national security threats for other nations domestically, not not taking into account the ethics and the need to stand up for principles and human rights and all that, that stuff. It's the, the assessment of China as the biggest threat to all of our national security. Um, or I wonder if a lot of this is tainted by US anxiety about being displaced. And on that, We've seen last week carry out this diplomatic coup uh, of having Saudi Arabia and Iran re-establish ties. I mean, you couldn't get a bigger illustration of waning US influence in that particular part of the world, a part of the world where the US was the main power broker. And we're seeing this, this big shift in, in regional politics between Riyadh and Tehran, as one brokered by President Xi just a couple months after he visited the region in person. I mean, what did you make of that? I mean, I think what, well, if we're talking about the Middle East, you do see declining American concern with the Middle East. But I think, you know, what is concerning is the fact that, well, let, let me put it like this. The world's refugees, are they queuing up to go to China or are they queuing up to come to Europe or the United States? We know exactly the answer to that question. They're certainly not queuing up to go to China. And why? I think the answer to the question is obvious. I don't need to answer it. The Afghans, you know, leaving Afghanistan because of the Taliban, China is just over the mountain. Why aren't they all piling into China? Not one of them is going there. I think the important thing to say is that we have to find a modus vivendi to live and work with China over time. But we need to do it with our eyes fully open and we need to have a clear understanding and knowledge of exactly what the Chinese strategically are thinking about and planning. And, you know, we need to be able to pressure the Chinese into becoming a more responsible player in the international community than they appear to be at the moment, I think. So I, I, I wouldn't like to be labelled as a sort of someone who, who's completely hawkish about China. Um, I, I think one has to try to have an open mind, but we, we, we need a different sort of relationship from the one that we have, as it were, allowed the Chinese to have. But I think there's a theme here which we should definitely develop because it's the key issue in international relations for the next 50 years. I think that's an excellent note to end on. Uh, I hope you don't mind me needling you and me playing devil's advocate. No, 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 I love it. I love being needled. And I think it's the perfect way to discuss these issues. You ask the provocative questions and your questions are quite correct. I mean, you know, we have to look at it through the perspective of the sort of questions you're asking. And I think that's exactly the way to try to articulate discussion about the problem. Excellent. That's it for this week's episode of One Decision. We drop new episodes every Thursday. Like and subscribe so you never miss an episode. Drop us a line. Tell us your thoughts. What decisions have impacted you and where you live? You can write to us. Our email is onedecision at onedecisionpodcast.com. From me and the team, thank you for listening and see you next time.